Chaim Shacharazani, and in the news, the recent security escalation in Judea and Samaria, and Tuesday's horrible Hamas terrorist attack, claiming the lives of four innocent Israelis, injuring four others. What are Israel's next moves, and why is this all happening now? To discuss this and so much more, I'm happy to have with us all the way from Israel, our good friend, IDF Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Yaron Buskila of the Israel Defense and Security Forum. Yaron is a retired, experienced IDF commander. He served as Deputy Brigade Commander, Battalion Commander, and Commander of the Southern Command Infantry Training Base, as well as Special Operations Officer in the Central Command. He was also responsible for many classified operations carried out by elite IDF units in Judea and Samaria. The perfect person to shed some light on what's been happening. Yaron, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Good evening from Israel. All the best. Um, first of all, let me ask you, with everything that's been happening this week, the clashes in Janine, and of course, the terrible terrorist attack that claimed innocent life yet again by Hamas in Israel. First of all, what is happening at the moment? What's the security situation on the ground in the last week? So what happened, just well, let's start with how, what happened today. Today, there was one more uh, terror attack against civilians living in Judah and Samaria. And unfortunately, four Israeli were killed, not so far away from where they live. And uh, this terror attack is just uh, part of the grow up and the raise of uh, the terror organization, especially in the north of the Judah and Samaria in the last, uh, in the last years. Um, yesterday, uh, as you probably heard, there was one more special operation in the north of Judah and Samaria, uh, in Jenin, one of the one of the cities that in the located in the north of Judah and Samaria. Jenin is more known uh, for Israelis as a terror area. A lot of terror activity came out from this place, and we found ourselves in a lot of uh, uh, operations inside the Jenin during the years. But uh, last night, there was just one more operation as almost every week when we're trying to uh, find the terrorist. But this time, the, we can say that this, uh, this operation got into trouble, tango, and uh, they wait for, wait for us with uh, explosive charge. And once they succeed, it started to uh, get into a very complicated situation that we tried to evacuate our soldier, soldiers. It wasn't so easy. We had uh, to involve a helicopter, combat helicopter, to help our soldiers get out from this area without any um, injury. So we, we are talking here, Yaron, about the series of incidents that take place in Judea and Samaria. Now, for the sake of our viewers, when you're talking about IDF continuous operation in those areas, what's happening there? Because some people might say, hey, maybe Israel is the one that's provoking the Palestinians. So what is the IDF doing there on a continuous basis? What is it trying to achieve? Well, first of all, the IDF all the time keep staying out of this uh, city or and not to get inside only if we have a specific uh, information about the terrorists uh, trying to uh, do some terror attack inside uh, inside Israel. So we never get inside if there is no uh, reason. When I say reason, it's I mean a reason of uh, a threat against Israeli lives. So we're trying to hold to hold them to hold it and to find them just before they getting out and trying to uh, to hurt. Israeli uh, civilians, same as they did today. What we saw today, not so far away from Eli, this is a village in the center of the Judean Samaria. This is a success. That this is one of the times where when we didn't get in the just in time uh, to find them before they're going into a terror attack. So when we go again getting inside just to arrest people, terrorists that just getting ready uh, to a terror attack. And uh, but unfortunately, because we are not staying there day after day after day, and we're trying to do our best not to get inside and not to disturb the people's life, if there is no specific reason, the terrorist people 
all of the terrorist organizations, the terrorists, just um, they take advantage of uh, of, uh, of the ways that we act to keep the people alive there and uh, not to get in, not to get to get in without a reason, and uh, and they use this area for for terror. So they this is it's terror. so. What you're saying now, Yaron, is so important for our viewers to understand. Israel defends forces. Defense has a meaning. Um, trying to defend innocent Israelis against acts of terror. If the Palestinians, you tell us, were just sitting there, you know, living their lives peacefully, there would be no reason for the IDF to operate in this area. The only reason there is IDF activity is to counter attacks, just like the one we saw on Tuesday, where innocent Israelis die. And that is a very uh, crucial point to make, because sometimes the, the way international media, as we all know, uh, describes the situation on the ground, it tends to depict Israel as the aggressor and the Palestinians as victims who are just responding to uh, to the situation. So thank you so much for clarifying this important point. Now, we understand that Tuesday's operation was carried out by Hamas. Um, Hamas, by the way, sits in Gaza, controls the Gaza Strip. Israel um, and, and Gaza are currently quiet, and yet Hamas is proud to underwrite, finance, lead terrorist activities in Judea and Samaria. How do you see that dichotomy? Can we, on the one hand, deal with Hamas in Gaza, and on the other hand, let it run amok in Judea and Samaria? Well, this is a very good question. So we're trying to separate between what's going on in Gaza to what's going on in the Judea and Samaria, because we're trying to keep the PA still relevant to this area. Once we are um, we are getting inside and we're fighting against the Hamas uh, without limits. So we are not get, like, giving the, to the PA the opportunity to do that. But unfortunately, in but the, wait, the PA, year, the PA, just for the sake of our viewers, the, the Palestinian Authority, Authority. Mahmoud Abbas. Exactly. exactly. But unfortunately, we gave them the chance to do so in the last year. We actually try. We almost didn't. Uh, set our forces in the north of Judea and Sumeria at all. Even when we, when we had specific information about the terrorists, we gave them the opportunity to do so because they asked uh, to be the responsible for the life and the security. And we can say that in, somehow we gave to our enemy the responsibility to defend our life. Right. So they didn't do so they didn't do, uh, uh, did, they didn't do anything about it because they didn't have uh, no uh, um I think they we could say that uh, they have no wish, no will to do that and no ability to do that because the corruption in the Palestinian authority was so hard that the the civilians, the Arab civilians pushed them away from the, the north of Judea and Samaria, almost for all of all of Judea and Samaria. And the Hamas just get got into this vacuum, and uh, not only the Hamas, uh, even the the, uh, the Jihad Islamic Palestinian organization and some other organization. And right now, the Palestinian Authority, we can say like, like in one hundred percent, not in the area of, of at all. So this attack is a direct result of the, we can say, uh, intensification of the terrorism in the Northern Samaria. Uh, the, it's uh, the weakness of the Palestinian Authority and the lack of the military uh, presence in the area. So the um, when you're talking about the Palestinian Authority, Aon, um, we know the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas don't exist in the Gaza Strip. Now you're telling us that they, they, they're barely present in these hubs of terror in the northern parts of Judea and Samaria, where they become clearly capitals of terror that Israel has to counter. And yet on world stage, we just saw Mahmoud Abbas visiting Beijing. There, there are talks at the UN. There is diplomatic attacks against Israel. Under these circumstances, how do you see the future of the Palestinian Authority and Israel's relationship with the PA? Where is that going to go if the PA doesn't even exist as an entity and is not able to deliver on the most important element of any future agreement or past agreement for that matter, which is security? Well, honestly, I don't see any future to the Palestinian Palestinian Authority 
not because I want or I don't want them to keep uh, and to be relevant. It's because they did everything uh, not to be to steal a net, to steal and to be still exist in this area. They, uh, as I said before, in the in the Oslo Agreement, we gave them all of the uh, opportunities and uh, to uh, to be the, to control this area, to control Gaza, to lead Judea and Samaria to a better life but they didn't do so. Actually, on the same day that they signed an Oslo agreement, it's the same day they established two terror organizations that they, they feed day after day, because in one hand, they want to keep coordinate with Israel. In the other hand, they want to keep and fight against Israel because in their belief, the fight never ends. In their belief, there will be no peace agreement until there will be no one Jewish, uh, one Jew in, in Israel, in all of Israel, not in the Judean scenario. Not I'm saying that, they saying that. Every time we try to uh, uh, get into a peace agreement with them, we keep heard time after time that the real uh, uh, three of, uh, of, of, of the leader, um, they thrill to uh, to uh, there will be no Jewish exist in the Judea and Samaria. So, as I said before, the corruption of the, the Palestinian Authority just make them be uh, and uh, not irrelevant in their population, in their by by their civilians. And right now, they keep losing city after city, and in Nablus. And uh, uh, even uh, Yericho uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, Hebron, Calcilia. Wow! Right now that's a bleak very, very that's a bleak, bleak future. You know, you, you're talking about Palestinian demands. You know, there is a common claim that we hear continuously here um, against Israel that says it's all about the settlements. If only you cease building the settlements, then there will be peace with the Palestinians. What you tell us now, Yaron, is that's not the case in the eyes of the Palestinians. No, it's not. I think that in the in the past we freezed a couple of times the building of the the settlements, the, the 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 Jewish villages, but nothing changed. Vice versa, for them, they just get it. Uh, uh, encourage them to do more terror activity activities because for them they saw that as a winning and not as a chance to a peace agreement. So every time that they recognize a weakness of, of from the Israeli side, for them this is encourage them to do more and more terror attacks. They never, uh, uh, they never uh, take our decision uh, or to our our try to get into a peace agreement and see that as an opportunity to change their life. You know, um, we're talking about you know how we see the future and the meaning of education. These terrorists, they're you know twenties, thirties. These are Palestinians who were born after the Oslo Accords were signed, supposedly to an era of what was uh, you know hoped to be peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And yet, we neglected all of those elements of education, allowing education for hatred and terror to continue. And now we are seeing the festering results. Um, for those of us who still remember, you know, the beginning of the two thousands when Israel had to um, operate extensively in those areas in Judea and Samaria to counter similar terror during the Second Intifada, it seems that this generation, which didn't experience um, those operations, which were very painful, I mean, terror, of course, to Israel, but for the Palestinian population, how do you see Israel moving forward? Do you think there is a, a reason for yet another Israeli incursion into Judea and Samaria? Do you think that Israel should operate against Hamas in, in Gaza? How do you see that? Because you have a lot of operational experience in general and specifically in that area, Yaron. I think that in this time, only a large scale mm -hmm. operation will change the situation in the area. Keep doing a, spe a, a special operation. Special operation is a small units that going uh, to a specific place. That's not ch change anything. Yes, we stop. We stop some of the terrorists, but right now the terror is so huge and so big that the, I don't think that a specific or special operation can change anything. 
we need to go to a big operation, same as protective age that we had in 2000. I was participating in protective age as a company commander. And look what happened in 2007. Uh, after seven years of fighting against the terror, something changed. And if you if you remember, and maybe some of your audience can remember, in 2007, the terrorists signed on a specific agreement. It's called the Wanted Person Agreement. And it was signed by, by them because they understood that they cannot uh, achieve anything at all. And Zacharias Beatty, one of the head of the terrorists in this North Judea and Samaria, one of the commander of uh, the, 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 it's called the Jihad Battalions. He signed on, of this agreement and he turned his life from a terror leader to a, a theater manager. So that, the was, yeah, so that was, um, yeah, I believe you're referencing defensive shield operation during the second defensive intifada, shield, yeah, which sorry. changed, which had a strategic impact on the ground. And you're saying, you're telling us that this is what's needed at the moment. Do you think that Israel might go in this direction? Yeah, you might go into this direction. I think that that's the right decision to take right now. It's different because in 2000, it was against the PA as, as well, because the Palestinian Authority turns our weapons against Israel. Right now, we're dealing only with terror, terrorist organization. I think that's the, that's the point right to do that, because if we will wait, we will see much more ammunition, much more guns, much more explosive charges. And I think it will be much more difficult if we will pay in our soldier life to bring the situation and to bring, to bring uh, back uh, to a normal as it was between 2007 to 2015. You know, um, you're talking about the professionalization process that terrorist organizations in Judea and Samaria are going through. And one of the things that comes to mind is the attack that took place against the IDF at the beginning of the week when the explosive uh, device was uh, used against the armored vehicles of the IDF. The entire event was filmed on camera, um, used this propaganda internally, boosted the terrorist organizations on the ground, almost the same propaganda systems that were used, unfortunately, to seeing uh, from Hezbollah in Lebanon, there is a certain uh, escalation, a certain upgrade in the capabilities under the watchful eye of Israel and apparently the irrelevant eye of the Palestinian Authority. First of all, how did that happen? And who's behind this, Yaron? Yeah, and I think first of all, you're you're you're, you're right. If you could heard uh, carefully uh, this uh, video, in this video, you can heard that they using a specific uh, a radio uh, to communicate between each other. So it's not one one man with a gun or random people that just shooting from uh, from many places. That was very organized. This is organization of terror. And it wasn't like that if you're just going back like eight or seven years. It wasn't like that because we were there. We were inside this area. We were have the ability to get inside and to go out whenever we want. But unfortunately, our government decided that the forces are not allowed to get inside. Only the Palestinian Authority will do the job for us. And they didn't. And that's how the, the, the terror rise again. That's why the terror organization becomes stronger. That's why we see all of this uh, shooting and all of the uh, explosive devices that we saw in this, in this movie. And once you, you just leave the vacuum, in this vacuum, it's not just staying empty. empty. Someone is getting inside. In this case, the terror organization just used this vacuum. And they, we can say that the Iranians as well Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the role of Iran in all of this. Yeah. So if you're just trying to find and to put the phone to, on the, to point where it all came from and who is just direct them exactly what to do and where from all of this weapon coming from, exactly from Iran, our Western border is not close enough and a lot of smuggling of weapons coming from Jordan into no, Israel. the eastern border. The eastern, eastern border. border yep. Eastern border, sorry. From Jordan into Israel by Iran. And then doing that because they want uh, that to flood 
all of the area with a lot of weapons, not only in Judean Samaria, even inside Israel, inside the Arab society. So right now, we can you can hear in the, in the, by the news that they use using it as, as, especially for uh, for crime re, for for criminal for crime reason, right. but but still it, they can use this weapon and they did it before and to turn to this weapon into a terror activity for terror and not only for crimes. So Iran continuously is continuously busy in destabilizing the region as much as possible, both you're saying within Judea and Samaria, and even within the, um, you know, sovereign borders, uh, internationally recognized borders of the state of Israel, not to mention, of course, its nefarious and negative involvement in other areas in the region, trying to destabilize what is viewed as the more moderate regimes. And in all into all of this mix, we're seeing Israel in the need to defend itself against these nests of terror. And if I understand you correctly, every day we wait, we may pay a, a, a more a dear price if we move later on, because these problems will continue to fester. They're not going to go away. Exactly, exactly. That's why I'm saying, and I, I keep saying today in uh, many interviews in the Israeli TV. And not only me, first of all, all of the IDF, the member in the IDF, the high rank colonel that uh, belong to the IDF. And even in the government, you can hear more and more that they saying that that's the point to go into a big scale operation if we want to change something and if we don't want to lose any other life, soldiers and civ Israeli civilians. Right. Specifically, um, if we're talking about defensive shield, I think in the public memory, one of the, and I think it's worth uh, reminding our viewers of that terrible moment when the uh, Janine, the IDF operated in Janine. And if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me because you were there on the ground, um, there was a decision taken not to use aerial attacks, but to bring in reserve uh, duty soldiers into Janine to uh, take out these terrorists. And at some point um, they were captured in a big yard and attacked and many of them lost their lives. I believe 13 in Janine. soldiers in Janine, Janine itself. So we were already, as we say, in that movie in the past. Yeah, you're right. But I think that the situation that uh, in these days was different because the terror was much more massive than in these days. And we don't need to wait we don't need to wait to get into this situation again, and we don't need to wait to make the terror stronger. That's exactly the point to change the situation, to change what we're dealing with. And if we will not do so, if we will not do so, we will find ourselves in a bigger operation. And as I said before, we will lose much more life. And I think for the security of the Israeli, and I can say even for the security of the Palestinians as well, for their better life, we have to do that right now. Otherwise, we, in both sides, we will lose life. Lose life. You know, one of the things that um, so many people out here miss about what's happening in the region is just how complex everything else. You know, they think it's so simple uh, when they say sentences like, it's all about the settlements. If only this happened, peace will prevail without realizing, like you told us today, about the Palestinian Authority, while Mahmoud Abbas, the head, is traveling to Beijing to uh, unveil another um, Arafat statue. Um, on the ground itself, the Palestinian moderate leadership doesn't exist in Gaza and is irrelevant in major cities in Judea and Samaria. And the result is yet more escalation. So we can all uh, join you in the hope for, you know, peace and tranquility in Israel. And we'll keep our eyes focused on what's happening in the next few days and weeks. I want to say a big thanks to you, Yaron, for taking the time to join us and to share with us your perspective on what's happening on the ground. It means a lot because there is a huge gap of information when it comes to the realities on the ground, not just with the general public, but also with some of the pundits and, and leaders in the area. So thank you for, for um, allowing us uh, your precious time and sharing these explanations. And most of all, thank you for your service for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people. Thank you for inviting me to this interview. Thank you very much to you, to, to your audience. And um, as I said, we all join you in prayer and hope for peaceful times for the people of Israel and may terror be Amen. defeated soon. 
Um, to our viewers, I'd like to thank you all for watching yet another In the News, covering the most important news items of the week. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's acting CEO, Dara Golob, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Razani. Until next time, see you soon. Shalom and lehitol.